The views expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of their organization. Welcome to the Enterprise Knowledge Cast, a look into the world of knowledge management, information management, data management, and everything in between. This is brought to you by Enterprise Knowledge. I'm Zach Wall, founder and CEO of UK. Today, we are speaking with Dave Simmons. Dave is the KM Specialist and Senior Records Officer at the U.S. General Services Administration. Dave, welcome. Thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having me, Zach. I always like to jump right in, and I hope that you don't mind. Tell me a little bit about how you define KM, especially as somebody that has a very senior position in the field within the federal agency. How do you get people to understand KM? What do you say? What's the value of it? Well, it's always a good question because it, it, it's a moving target depending on who you're talking to. But I always say that KM, in a quick definition, it's understanding and collaborating with an organization in the definition, design, creation, use, and ongoing management of information to support the organization's mission. And I always end in the mission because that's what they're listening for is that language of success, which I'll probably hammer away at throughout this interview. But I think that what they need to understand is we're looking at how information's used. When I describe what I do to people that have no, no experience with KM, I say I'm an information plumber. I fix people's pain. The other thing I say is I offer two-way translation services between the business lines and the IT technologies, focusing mainly on the content creation, use, and management. Those tend to resonate with folks when I talk about the value of KM and how we can improve their ability to see the larger issues, to make better informed decisions, and, and to be more confident to having access to reliable and timely information to make those decisions or to get their work done. And so it's Perfect. sort of secondary to the IT function, but it is very critical because it's focused on the content and the needs of the individuals. Dave, there's a lot to like about that definition. One thing that I always really appreciate is your use of verbs. When you talk about defining and designing and using and creating and managing, all of these paint a picture for what the end user will actually get out of KM. But I actually want to pull on a different piece of what you said. You mentioned early on, it depends on the audience. And I think this is really striking. And I imagine what you mean is that different people have different priorities and different business needs. And so you're going to explain KM a little differently to them. Can you expand on that a little bit? I think that one of the things you have to be aware of is how the organization defines its success mm -hmm. and how the individual you're talking to defines success. If you're talking to somebody who's in IT, they're looking at the usual things of, one, running systems that are modern, using the latest technologies and reliable and cost-effective. That's a CIO, for instance. Or mm -hmm. secondly, they're looking for qualities where knowledge management will help them translate IT functionality into business success with the business lines they're working with. If I'm in the business side of the world, talking to them about defining knowledge management, which was the original question, I'll probably talk more about information in the abstract and how it's going to help them solve their pain and how they're focused on speed to market or time to market and, and or reliability or how fast it takes to collect information to make good decisions and things like that, because those qualities are things that they're listening for in terms of their ability to meet their own mission. Excellent. This is a growing theme and one that's been lacking in KM for too long is really taking an outcomes-based approach to it and saying, how will this save us money? How will this make us more efficient? How will this help our people learn more effectively? How will it help them do their job better so they can get home and spend time with their kids? All, all of these are the right way, in my opinion, to talk about KM. It's great to hear you expressing it in those terms. You mentioned success, and what I'd love to hear from you is, what is the definition of successful KM at GSA? What does it mean for somebody to be doing good KM? Or how is your job measured as successful or as, as accomplishing its goals? Well, my job has changed. When I was hired in 2007 at GSA to be a knowledge management specialist, success was defined differently. 
And since 2013, when I was moved into records management, I defined KM success in yet a different way. But I'll start with the first one. When I was brought into GSA as a knowledge management specialist, the commissioner who really wanted me in there sat me down in the first couple of days and said, what I have a problem with is within public building services, that branch of GSA that deals with federal buildings and leasing property to agencies, we have seven, eight different lines of business within PBS, and none of them are talking to each other. They all are siloed out and we have leasing, we have building construction, we have property management. They use the same language, but it all means different things. And so success for me then as a knowledge management practitioner was to define those bridges across those silos and getting them to use each other's resources and language. And language is a big factor, I think, the common use of language within knowledge management across different lines of business and an understanding that they may not use the same terms, but the concepts are congruent. And the difference is it's mostly focusing on the similarities of process, the similarities of language or concepts rather than the distinguishing factors. I think that's where success for KM comes. When I moved into records management, it was part of a larger problem in that we had very specifically a lot of material around buildings and building information that was not well defined. And the higher I went, it was either technology-based or it was policy-based, but there was no regulations on this. And so I dipped my toe into records management, which I hadn't been involved in in probably 20, almost 30 years in records management, which is the one management you didn't mention in your intro, by the way. And, and records <laughs> we'll, we'll management, <laughs> yeah, well, well, records management is, is like the content guys at the end of the parade with the pooper scoopers. They clean up <laughs> all the stuff and they figure out what to do with it. They create the audit trails for what happened to that stuff when somebody's yeah. looking for it and it's good and dead or destroyed or deleted or whatever. And so I had to go to a records management level, which in the federal government is based on the National Archives record schedules, and found out it was a complete mess. And you need to normalize this and get it straightened out as a source of truth so that all the business lines across GSA could do that. Well, seven years later, we got it all approved. We got it all simplified, and now we're starting to move forward by creating that central resource of truth, and that's a success. And now we can hitch other things like taxonomic development. I've been working with Angela out of your team on taxonomy mm -hmm. for the last five years, and Joe, when we were developing a centralized document management system and identifying the common meta tags and labels and foldering. All that's come out of this kind of appreciation for some kind of central resource to draw upon as we encounter different projects for dealing with electronic content. You know, I was not expecting to have the uh, phrase pooper scooper included in this particular podcast, but oh, yeah. I, I appreciate the metaphor. I was hoping we would get to this idea of records management because I think too many organizations treat records management as the thing that is going to keep us out of jail, the thing that is just meeting the regulatory requirements. But Dave, you're hitting on, I think, a really important point. If you are smart about your records management, it actually has great ramifications, positive ramifications for findability, for being able to access the right content, for getting people to act on that central resource or that golden source of truth rather than having to hunt around. And so you're expressing the value of records management in terms of KM and the business. And I, I really appreciate that. I think that's a great way to look at it. Did you have to change minds at GSA or was that already built in? Were people already understanding the business value of records management or did you need to teach that? I had to teach it. You have to yeah. demonstrate it daily. That's a big challenge in a well-entrenched organization. What I found was something I learned in the years I worked in libraries and library consortiums. If you can get two people or more in a room that may think they're unrelated and they start talking about their work, sooner or later they're going to find common ground mm -hmm. and common problems they're trying to solve and start sharing. 
that is the principle that I operate under when I'm dealing in knowledge management is that they're approaching it from this end of the stick and this group is approaching it from this end of the stick. And once they meet in the middle, they'll have some kind of synergy about solving a problem. And it really is not about territory or geography or status in the organization. It's about solving problems because everybody wants to see organizational success and when you're focused on the table, on the problems at hand you're trying to solve, you start to get into those issues of how much do you know about this? What kind of language do you use to describe the problem? What kinds of solutions have you already tried and either didn't work or you couldn't afford or you lacked the people resources to do this? Because then we may be able to collaborate and create a third solution, a synergistic solution that would work between both of us as a collaboration to solve the problem. When I try to describe knowledge management and records management simultaneously, I always talk about how I can't do RM alone. I depend on a lot of people that barely can pronounce taxonomy that, that understand they need a central subject term base to draw from and get all content to be labeled as such to improve search. You know, a common subject tree. You know, I'm hearing a fair bit of couples therapy in here as well, as you're talking about alignment and finding the common ground. I guess we can add that to the booper scooper metaphor as well. It's striking to me because you're absolutely right. I've done a fair bit of taxonomy in my day, and you always hear over and over and over again how an individual business line is going to say, no, we're really different. We use different words. We have different processes. We're special. We're different. We can't align. And when you start pulling the strings and, and putting things together and putting people in the room and asking them the right questions, as you point out, those assumptions get broken down awfully quickly. So it's great to get a, a proof case of that from you. Let's go back a little bit. Dave, how did you get into the field? <laughs> well, that's a funny story. This happened back in 2002. I had spent, well, nearly 20 years in the library business, running large consortiums and working as an academic librarian and public librarian and various roles in IT. Uh, I worked for a software company. But in 2002, I spotted a job that looked interesting. They were asking for a research librarian at Lego Toys in Billund, Denmark. I decided, what the heck? I'd like to try that because it looked interesting. I applied and interviewed for the job, and they said, well, what do you think this job is about? And I said, well, I'll tell you what, if you're looking for a guy just to buy books and check them out and catalog them and keep track and dust them occasionally, I'm not your guy. And they said, oh, and, and I said, here's, here's the thing. I think of myself as a collaborator. Back when I was in academics, as a collection development specialist in, in the humanities and history work, I would sit down with these researchers and find out what they're looking for and then start to research what other topics might be related, which is taxonomic work, and also what kinds of books and articles and people they should be reading. And this is sort of, I'm not across the table from them, I'm alongside of them, collaborating on their success. And it's not about the physical books and keeping track of all that as much as working with them in solving their own problems and collaborating with them in identifying a problem and then coming up with possible solutions, which is what a reference librarian does, but working within their own field and their own content base of understanding. And they said, well, what would you call that? I said, I don't know, knowledge management? And they said, oh, I like that. I get through with the interview, I fly back, and I, I mentioned it to my mother, who at the time was a project leader in the Department of Energy. She says, you know, there's a whole field on that. I said, no kidding. <laughs> Actually, so I, I, I need to understand this. You did not know that. I did not know that. Thing. I was completely oh, out of ignorance. Okay. It just called it knowledge management. Fantastic. And Good. then I found out, oh, yeah, it's a full field. So I was brought in. And then they go turned around, changed the title to Director of Knowledge Management and then hired me in as the director of knowledge management for Lego Toys. And thank God at that point you knew that it was actually a field. And well, I, I'd it. done some reading by then. I did Carlo yeah, Dell's yeah. book and a couple other things. After I came back, I moved back to Chicago and interviewed in different positions and realized that I, I liked this knowledge management thing. So I took Doug Widener's CKM program and continued on in knowledge management from then on. And then the rest is all history. 
You also, I think, have uh, lived my dream job. I can't even imagine how happy I would be if I got to work at Lego. That is oh, it's way cool. cool. It yeah. was way cool. I, I've kept up with toy designers who are now in Hasbro and other companies all over the world. And I was one of the few Americans. It was mostly Danes and Brits and Portuguese and Germans and Norwegians. And you learn the language and you talk a lot and you laugh a lot and you drink a lot. And Legos to boot. I love it. Fantastic. Yeah. So it's interesting. You know, I think about half the people that I've gotten to speak with through the podcast have stumbled into KM. And the other half have come through a very deliberate library or information science background. You're a little bit of both. You yes. kind of have the traditional background, but you also sort of stumbled into the field. That's a neat middle ground. Now, what would you recommend to somebody who's listening to this and saying, well, that sounds pretty cool. I want to do that. Where would you recommend they get started or how would they break into the field? One of the paths that they always emphasize is the path of, of learning new technologies and how you can apply them in places. But I'm going to take my thinking about this as knowledge management falls into two camps. One camp is focused on soft skills and HR and potential development. And the other camp is focused on technology, applied technology applications, development of third-party applications to help those other applications support them. If I'm talking to a person getting into the business of knowledge management, I would probably focus them on understanding how to define problems, understanding user needs, making plans and recommendations, identifying options, and linking program goals to organizational success. Project management, consulting, budgeting, both time and money, and communications are the kinds of areas that I would tell them to apply. You notice I'm not saying degrees. I'm really thinking that this stuff can be picked up with psychology degrees or with various other business degrees or other applications. But the areas that I'm talking about are those things that leadership who make a lot of decisions and management who make a lot of decisions are looking for, and they most closely identify with those skills when they see it in other people. And that way, then you get their attention. Now, project management, budgeting, communications, that is the skill set of somebody that could be successful in pretty much any field. Yes. We're looking for the unicorns is the way that I put that. I, I don't disagree with your skill set, but that's a challenge, right? And when you add on to that, if you are taking that applied technology approach, you're also requiring that somebody at least be able to understand the tech, even if they're not a developer or a coder, they need to be able to translate to IT. Agreed. You're right there. And I started to go down that path mentally and didn't say anything. But I, I think a lot of that can be picked up if you've identified the real problem of getting information in people's hands, the technology starts to answer itself as you go through the whole gamut of what are the possibilities of what kind of technology could address that. And that usually can be picked up on the job rather than in an isolated situation. Now, that's not to say you shouldn't understand basic database management terminology or word processing terminology or things like that, because those were wild things when I was a kid that I had to teach myself. But I think they're ubiquitous now, Zach. I think they're much more out there and common use. Now we're going back to a lot of the soft skill development, the ability to identify problems and then pick up the tools to solve those problems at a later date. I completely agree, but I also would say that's a tall order when you list all of these different skills to be somebody who's successful in KM. You mentioned on the job several times. How can somebody begin down this path or begin to get exposed to the right opportunities to develop these skills? The key is information pain. You listen very carefully. If you're already in the office, understanding what the pain is within your industry or within your organization, what people are complaining about not finding stuff quickly enough. The search engine in our browser stinks. Never get the document I need to make that decision quickly enough. Or we have to make a gut intuition judgment call on this decision because we just don't have the time to collect the information. Those are all examples of information pain. People that lack confidence in a product or a project or anybody that expresses doubt is showing information pain. On the flip side of that, if you're in the organization, learn the language of success. What does that organization say is successful? 
You don't have to look at people to see who the successful people are in status. It's how they define what gets paid, what gets rewarded. And I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about what metrics are used to describe success. If you looked at an annual report, it's all about the success metrics. It may be qualitative rather than quantitative, but they're all there and evident. And so then what you can do to be successful to identify those opportunities for KM is to match where the information pain is. And by solving that information pain, how you can address those metrics of success for the organization. Great. This idea of tying an organization's KPIs or success metrics or, or even overall mission to what can KM do for that, I think is a really great point. And it really tracks when you're talking with an e-commerce organization or a sales organization, it's going to come down to sales. It's going to come down to greater turnover of product. If you're talking to a consultancy, it's going to be about clients and client retention and employees and employee retention. And there's a, a KM mission and message in each of those different things that you can find if you know how to look. But beginning with the success metrics and the information pay as you suggested, Dave, I think is a really excellent thought exercise for those that might be struggling to make the dots connect. I really like that. I want to go back to something you said. You mentioned the two types of KMers. There's the soft KM person that's focused on people and learning and organizational design. And then there's more of the applied technology KMer. And and I've been happy to see, I think, in recent years, those worlds coming together. It's not so much Macy's and Gimbel's one or the other. It's more collectively, we're smart. We know that both these things are required. Are you seeing that trend as well? Uh, yes. And if so, why do you think that is? Why did we get smarter? Why are we doing better collectively at this point? I think what's happened is in the 90s and the early 00s, we were seeing KM being defined by its technology, and we were letting the industries kind of tell us what knowledge management was. And it usually meant buying a product or investing millions of dollars in the one single solution that was going to be the central repository, the knowledge base. The, the portal. The, the, yeah, the portal. Oh, yes, the, the all-powerful portal. The things you build, and after you build it, nobody either maintains it, nobody goes to it. The lessons learned encyclopedia. Building technology centrally takes a huge lift and a huge investment that's multi-year, as you said. KM is a multi-year activity. And when you have people that are measuring success based on a fiscal year basis um, in, in terms of budget, investment, and outcomes, then this is a really hard sell. The central solution is one of the reasons. And when you define KM, you can't just point to a new technology and say, that will solve it. SharePoint will solve all your problems. You're going to have to deliver, as part of the KM package, integrators that can do that. The training and understanding of that information and agreement on the behaviors for finding material, identifying the search patterns and things like that. And that's going to take people that are embedded in the organization more so than just relying on a five-year contract to get her done. Technology has shifted from being a capital investment where you plop down a whole lot of money all at once or over a couple of years to understanding that technology is a utility just like cable connections. And there's really two ways that I could interpret that. I mean, software as a service, there's a very literal interpretation of this idea of technology as a utility. But I think you're also saying that if you're not constantly investing and reinvesting in the design and the use and the governance and the support of your technology, it's all for naught. Am I interpreting correctly that it's both of those things? Yeah, I think there's a curatorial role that KM needs to design into its processes that almost require that you have staff that understand not only the deliverables of that project, but how it's integrated into the large organization. And I think that's so true. The days of if you build it, they will come, I think, have long since passed. And if people aren't designing for the end users and the, the business as a whole and understanding how that needs to be dynamic and change, then boy, you're in a lot of trouble. You know, you've got a great perspective on this, Dave. I've got to ask, you have led KM in a major federal agency. You've also led it in huge corporations. What's the difference between those two, if any? I really try to focus on the similarities, so differences is a bit of a challenge to me. The difference is, I think, there is probably 
in the corporate world a lot more willingness to take risk because their money is not something they're holding in trust for the taxpayer in terms of good stewardship of the money and the accountabilities that go along with it. So you're a little, they're a little freer with their thinking and their planning, and they're willing to try five different ideas. Whereas I think in the federal government, and this is my first federal government, I've worked in state governments, but I've never worked in federal governments. It's my first federal government job where I think they're more focused on getting the one solution that's going to work. Mm -hmm. And then it is either your pass fail. Whereas I think in corporate world, they'll take on five or six different ideas and see which one rises to the top. I think that makes sense. The concept of agile, of maybe failing more often, but failing smaller, tends to be a little more comfortable in the commercial space. And we see that more. That said, I've been encouraged and pleased by, I think, the greater prominence of KM within federal agencies and the greater willingness to try things and to experiment. So I, I do see some cracks in this. I do see some real, really good progress. Kind of on the same line, you've got this career of great experience. What's the big mistake that you see over and over again in organizations that they're making regarding knowledge management transformations or programs that you would want to warn our listeners against? The biggest disservice we're doing to the profession right now is capitalizing KM. We're making it the central field in everything we do, and everything else is peripheral. What we need to do is be the force behind the throne, the quiet voice that's whispering, the worm tongue to the king, you know, basically <laughs> describing quietly how you can connect and consult with internally on how you can be more collaborative within your organization and be less prominent. I think that sometimes we have an esteem problem of being recognized in knowledge management as central to the success of the organization. I think we need to take a step back and say, we're peripheral, we're supportive. We have more of a supportive role than a central delivery role. We're focused on the mission success, however that happens. Because what I've seen as the big mistakes, the obvious ones, the big ribbon cutting for a KM initiative. Mm -hmm. People have a problem understanding what the word knowledge is within organizations, and to list something as a new fad or a new praise, I think that doesn't do us a good job. I think knowledge management is more of a verb than a noun. It's a process of discovery of information. It's a process of improving information management, more so than an industry in its own right. I like a lot of what you just said, with the exception of the fact that you've made KM the most despicable character in the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to work on that. This is in line with what we heard from another one of these interviews. And the way that they talked about this, and I really liked it, is to say that people shouldn't be saying that they're doing knowledge management. People should just be doing their job. And because of knowledge management in the background, it's happening easier and faster and more naturally. Is That's, that's, yeah. that's the thrust of what you're saying, if I'm correct. Yes, definitely. It's all behind the scenes for the most part. When we try to step out of the limelight, we make ourselves a target. And they start comparing AI with KM. Heaven forbid records management would ever be in competition with knowledge management. <laughs> We're, we're even further. We're in the basement with the toilet paper closet. But basically, it's one of those things where when you step out too far ahead, there's an expectation that you're going to create an entire division and you're going to have lots of minions doing work for you. And all of a sudden, the bureaucracy starts to collapse on its own when you can't deliver year after year new things. The next area that I think where people make big mistakes is they focus too much on the one technology that's going to be the solution. I was just recently reading an article posted regarding trends in the 2021 on knowledge management, where they were talking about a headless CMS. And this headless CMS idea is really what I think is critical to taking that back seat. And that is focusing on linking, connecting content that's already being created where it is, rather than trying to create a new technology to corral all those cats into one place and getting them for branding as knowledge management. It's not going to work. You need to figure out how to create that, call it a hive mind, where you're all connected so well that when you're looking for the leader in describing knowledge management trends, and rather than doing a Google search, you can click on your phone and it comes up with, 
Yeah, Zach Wall. What do you know? He just wrote an article yesterday about this. That way, then, you start to create interesting linkages between people and objects and content as it's being created. And I think that's the role we should be playing. And this is a really exciting time. I mean, first of all, I, I, I'm glad you enjoyed the blog. I think that the connection between headless CMS and knowledge graphs and ontologies, all of this together, what we're saying is content should be traversable in all its forms. Find a person and then find a piece of information they've worked on. And then through that, find a community of practice that's discussing the topic. And through that, find a piece of learning so you can extend your concepts of understanding. And from there, find the data that's backing up that community of practice. This idea of all content having a place and feeling like a natural walk down an office where you're just seeing a poster on the wall and then you're talking to somebody and then you're seeing a book and you're picking it up. That's how people learn. That's how people experience knowledge or should if it's done in the right way. I love the fact that you're invoking that. And yet the technology is still just the enabling factor, right? It doesn't yes. work at all without all of the other things that you've talked about, the taxonomies and the content. Yeah, it's the interlinking of data, content, people, processes, documentation, all those things, so that it can meet people where they need it, rather than trying to create the one place they have to go to. It may be local, but then if it's interlinked, you cut down on the work processes to get it all migrated into a central place and curated. There you go. And the days of data lakes and master data management, and we're going to move everything into one giant bucket. I think that's been proven to fail time and time again. Oh, yeah. I like how you put that, Dave. We're going to meet people where they need it. There's this phrase in the learning communities of learning at the point of need. And I think you just invoked knowledge at the point of need as a, a really similar concept. Yeah. It's basically trying to anticipate where they're going to need that piece of documentation. Let me give you an example how AI could meet this need. If you had a person logged on and they were going into an app and the machine could tell you when they last logged on was over a year ago, wouldn't it make sense to create a document access point for a manual on how to use this thing to remind them a year later how they can get around in it? That kind of AI is easily done by just working at the account information of that application and when the last time the person logged on. That's basic context, and it's what a lot of people don't get at this point. That's doable today. There's oh, yeah. nothing magical about that. You don't need to go buy a fancy, giant, Watson blue box AI in order to achieve knowledge AI that's going to help people do their jobs today, help people learn and perform more effectively. Yeah, we're calling it AI. We used to just call it context-based kind yeah. of usage and process. I mean, some of the concepts have not changed a whole lot over the years. Yes. It's just the labels have changed. The idea is trying to identify what the person's going to need at the time and design systems to anticipate that need. Well said. I would say the mission or the goal hasn't changed. The technologies to make it happen have definitely gotten better. And I think we're at a cool point of inflection where the tools are, are getting there. I think they're making it easier to achieve the goals that we want. Dave, we'll end with this. It's fitting, given the topic that we just covered. What are you most excited about within the capital K and capital M industry? Even though we're not supposed to capitalize it, what are you most excited about right now? What I'm finding is a heightened interest in understanding concepts and language and using them across the enterprise. We're coming up with better tools for building taxonomies and ontologies, collections of taxonomies. And we're getting better at having tools that can help negotiate differences or map content in such a way that multiple people can use it. Sometimes when I'm pushed and people are joking about taxonomies, I'll say, well, I used to call it taxidermy, stuffing a whole lot of terms into a dead animal because they don't all interrelate very often. But sometimes you have to figure out how they bridge and how these concepts work. And some of these terms are really colloquial or, or obscure or obsolete, but they're still valued. And coming up with that control vocabulary, which is the language we use in the library business, you need to have some kind of central resource and the taxonomy can serve as such. And that, I find that exciting when people are starting to realize that common languages for the business 
are starting to create those abilities to cross those silos. When I was involved in knowledge management at Lego, they had seven factories making Lego products in seven different countries and seven different languages. They came up with a lexicon of the block where they would use the same terms in their own language, but they could translate. This is before Google Translate could translate words very easily. But the idea is they took their company terminology and made a lexicon for that. So when you say a certain kind of plastic, it doesn't matter which language it's in, they all know what that means. And so I'm starting to see that kind of lexical conformity happening within organizations. I find that very exciting. First of all, I think that I would agree with that trend. I like the fact that the idea of taxonomies and ontologies at the enterprise level are fueling part of that trend. And moreover, I like the fact that even if somebody's designing an enterprise taxonomy or a controlled vocabulary or a complete enterprise lexicon for a specific application, it positively infects the business. What I've found is that people collaborate more effectively. They use language where they're not talking past each other once that language exists. And so to paraphrase what you're saying here, I mean, it, it might be for a purpose, but it's something that can truly be transformative to the organization if done well. Another trend uh, that I'm finding is the linkages like API and low coding that are enabling us to keep our collections of objects that are created wherever they are and linking them to each other, either a data set or using a data mart to inform tagging for content on documents. Those kinds of linkages, I think, are very exciting because then they start to develop that sense of connection that enables, like you said, to be able to create a single search to bring back a lot of content. In a way, it's, a, it's the other side of the same coin, right? It's establish a vocabulary, create connection points, and you might not even know how it will be applied in the future, but if you design it well, it could have additional purposes and value to the organization you don't even know. Excellent. First of all, Dave Simmons, CAM Specialist and Senior Records Officer. Thank you so much. Really great conversation. And boy, if you hear about any openings at LEGO, just let me know. Uh, <laughs> for those of you listening to this episode of KnowledgeCast, thank you. To learn more, check out our website at enterprise-knowledge.com. Dave, thanks again. Thank you. I appreciate the time.